Harden not your hearts. And it was night, the fall of Judas. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. The church in Passion Time repeats these words in the beginning of her daily office. The words are impressed on us by being repeated so many times. They strike a note. They enforce an idea. Why has the church chosen the above for Passion Time? She evidently wants us to think this out and to ponder over the following questions. What is a hard heart? How do we harden our heart? The answers are, a hard heart is one that is unmoved by big graces. We harden our heart by neglecting small graces, by letting a perverse inclination develop. We drift thus into spiritual mediocrity, and mediocrity develops into hardness of heart. The heart of Judas is shown us in the gospel. It seems to have suggested this repetition of our text. The hardening of heart in the case of Judas was extreme, no doubt. But lesser hardness is common. The careless priest, the careless religious, the careless student, the careless man or woman who is unchanged by retreats and warnings and advice. We can learn and understand the growth of hardness by studying an extreme case. At the same time, we can study one of the great sorrows of Jesus. This will lead us to resolve to be ever faithful to him, to be like the chosen disciple who rested on his bosom and who stood with Our Lady at the foot of the cross. The Sacred Heart of Jesus suffered in a particular way from the sins of those he specially loved. The nature of the human heart is such that great pain comes when one's love is rejected. The words of our Lord to St. Margaret Mary confirm this. Behold the heart that has loved men so much, and is so little loved in return. During the Passion, the Sacred Heart suffered from the sins of his chosen apostles. He was deserted by them, all. He was denied by one. These were sins of weakness. He was betrayed and sold. It was a sin of malice. This last sin was such a sorrow to our Savior that his prophet spoke of it centuries before and even named the price for which he would be sold. The fall of a chosen apostle who fell and never rose again, who fell for all eternity, is a lesson for us all, a lesson of fear. St. Paul warns those that stand to take heed lest they fall. He tells us to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. His own soul was penetrated with a most real fear. He was an apostle. He understood the privilege. But he remembered the fall of a fellow apostle. Hence he feared, and hence he tells us, I chastise my body, lest I become a castaway. If an apostle fell, if an apostle feared lest he might fall, have we too not reason to fear? The most terrifying fact in the fall of Judas is the hardness of his heart at the end. The gospel story reveals a hardness of heart that's almost incredible. The possibility of our heart becoming hard is one of the great lessons we can learn from meditating on this episode of the gospel. We can then consider with spiritual profit the history of the fall of this wretched apostle. Antecedents when Christ began to preach, many disciples were drawn to follow him by his doctrine and miracles. Among these was Judas. He must have been a good young man to be attracted by the austere doctrine and the simple life of the youthful prophet of Nazareth, the prophet who taught self-denial and humility and poverty, and who practiced what he taught, not having even a place whereon to lay his head. The heart of Judas, in the beginning, must have been full of admiration and love for the person of our Lord. Grace spoke to his heart, and he answered and followed the divine call. Judas was in the beginning among the general body of the disciples, but a day came when he was raised to a special position of dignity and privilege. He was chosen as one of the twelve apostles. The selection of the twelve apostles was a most important event in the life of our Savior. He was about to begin the work of the foundation of his church by selecting the twelve pillars on which that church would be founded. 
The Gospel tells us that Jesus spent the previous night in prayer on the mountainside, and when day dawned, he called his disciples together, and he selected twelve whom he named apostles. Of all mankind, these twelve were chosen for the most sublime dignity we can imagine after that of the Immaculate Mother of God and St. Joseph, and one of that chosen twelve was Judas. There was no doubt of his call, of his vocation. Have I not chosen you twelve, says Christ, and again, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you. With the favor of being chosen as an apostle came many others. To him were spoken the promises. He that receiveth you receiveth me. He that heareth you heareth me. And again, you shall sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Consider the force of these words. To him was given the power of miracles. This great power was put in his hands. He gave them power over demons and to cure the sick, says St. Luke. Judas had power over devils, yet he fell under their power. The first consequence for the twelve of being chosen as apostles was the privilege they had in what may be called their novitiate. The apostles needed special training for the wonderful work before them, for preaching the gospel, for teaching all nations, for guiding the church. The nearly three years of preparation were given to them. The privileges of this time were precious beyond all human words, and all these precious privileges were bestowed on Judas. Let us consider them in detail. Judas had the instruction and the direction of Jesus. All who are in earnest value instruction in the things of God and the advice of a wise director. The apostles were instructed by Jesus every day and had the eternal wisdom as director. Recall the scene when Jesus gave the explanation of his parables in the evening after preaching. Judas had all these privileges and more besides. He had the society of Jesus and Mary. Jesus appointed twelve to be with him, as distinct from the seventy-two. Consider the influence of the society of our Lord and his Holy Mother. Contemplate the familiarity of the apostles with Jesus. For years they watched him every day. They knew the various expressions of his beautiful face. They were familiar with the tones of his sweet voice, the touch of his hand, the look of his eyes were known to them. After Mary and Joseph, they were the most privileged. They were the first children of Mary. Judas had these privileges. He was a child of Mary. The change of soul, in spite of all these privileges, in spite of all these favorable surroundings, a change came in the heart of the unfortunate apostle. Jesus read that heart and saw the change. Judas began, no doubt, by neglecting, that is, by not profiting from the favors and graces which he daily received. He paid little attention to the instructions of Jesus. He noticed not the example of Mary, the silent eloquence of her who kept the words of Jesus, pondering them in her heart. At first there was some passing remorse. Judas felt the sting of conscience. Now and then some special word of Jesus came straight home to him, or some gracious act of our Savior spoke strongly to his heart. But Judas did not attend to these holy reactions. He resisted actual grace. He was hardening his heart. Our Savior, who knew all, must have warned the apostle many times in his own gentle way. And when the gentle warning was unheeded, the words became stronger until on one occasion, even a year before the Passion, we hear Jesus saying, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? The grace of these warnings was resisted. Along with this neglect of grace there was a passion growing up in the heart of the Apostle Judas, a passion that began by a very small indulgence, but which ultimately possessed the whole soul of this wretched man. The growth of all passions is the same. They have small beginnings. His passion was avarice. What will you give me? he asked. 
The first step was to betray confidence. The position of bursar was a position of confidence. But because of the poverty and charity of Jesus, it was only a small amount he had to keep. He began to covet a trifle, a small coin. St. John says this. It was an abuse of confidence. How often has the ruin of a religious begun by a small breach of poverty or some other vow? All ruin, in fact, has a small beginning. In the world, spiritual ruin often begins by a little dishonesty, a breach of confidence. The next step in the case of Judas was to dislike those who opposed his passion and to play the hypocrite. The passion was growing. He was no longer satisfied with the small coin, and hence his murmurs against St. Mary Magdalene for the outpouring of her ointment so pleasing to Jesus. This incident shows how the mind of Judas had ceased to be the mind of Jesus. Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? He said this, says St. John, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. To indulge in a passion, we are easily led to be hypocrites. Our love, our confidence in superiors and companions is broken, and when a difficulty arises, we have nowhere to turn. Finally, Judas was ready to use any means to gratify himself, even that which was most sacred he would not let stand in his way. To secure his end, he would trample on all obligations. In his passion, he saw even in his divine master a means of increasing his store and of gratifying his thirst. He knew the priests were anxious to capture Jesus. He knew they feared the people, and hence would surely give a bribe to anyone who would enable them to effect this capture without tumult. He silenced remorse by saying that after the capture Jesus could escape, as he had so often done before. Once the plan was formed, he set about the execution. He waited about the temple, watching for an opportunity of communicating with the priests. At length, he managed to secure an interview. What will you give me, he said, and I will deliver him to you. They forgot the prophecy and appointed thirty pieces of silver as the price of the treachery. Judas is satisfied. He returns to the apostles. He puts on a pleasant face, as if all is well, as if nothing has happened, but his heart. This betrayal, this climax of treachery, leads us to consider the hardness of heart to which Judas was led by his neglect of grace and by his indulgence of a passion. This is a really terrifying part of his terrible history. The closing scene in the Gospel manifests to us in Judas a hardness of heart that is almost incredible. Nothing can move him, nothing can touch him. Favors, acts of gracious kindness, words of touching sweetness, all pass without effect. When we remember the chances he had, the favors he received, the instructions he listened to, the intimate familiarity with Jesus which he enjoyed, and when in contrast to all that, we contemplate the closing scene, then we begin to realize the unspeakable consequences of his neglect and self-indulgence. Let us now contemplate these closing scenes. Let us try to realize the hardness of the Apostle's heart, that, knowing how we have been favored, we may learn to fear the slight infidelities which by degrees lead to spiritual ruin. THE CONSUMMATION OF THE CRIME When Holy Thursday evening came, Jesus and the Twelve gathered together to celebrate the Pasch of which the Savior had spoken, saying, With desire have I desired to eat this Pasch with you. After supper, the Lord Jesus rose from table, girded himself with a towel, took a basin of water, and began to wash the feet of his disciples. Contemplate Jesus at the feet of Judas, Judas who had already sold him. He took those feet in his venerable hands. The touch of Jesus had given sight to the blind, cured the lepers, raised the dead. But here it was without effect. The heart of Judas was hardened. Jesus looked up into his face as he knelt before the traitor, 
The look of Jesus had converted Magdalene, had brought the hot tears of sorrow to the eyes of Peter, who had denied him. But here that look was without effect. Even those eyes of love could not touch the heart of Judas. Not even the words of Jesus to the apostles, You are clean, but not all of you, which told him that Jesus had read his heart, not even these words had any effect. When our Savior sat down again to table and began to speak to the apostles, the traitor received further graces and favors and warnings, but all in vain. He heard those words of sweetness recorded by St. John, which have been the delight of the faithful and which have moved the hearts of thousands, but in his heart, although the words were spoken by Jesus himself, there was no response. He saw Jesus troubled as he gave the first warning words. Amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. He heard the warning repeated. He heard the apostles asking, Is it I, Lord? He even joined in the question and heard our Savior answer, Thou hast said it. But not even these words touched him. He heard the threat, Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man shall be betrayed but no threat could move that hard heart. Finally, as St. John says, Satan entered into him, and he went out, and it was night, the never-ending night, the eternal darkness. When Judas left the supper room, he knew that our Lord would pass the night in Gethsemane. St. John tells us that Judas knew the place, as Jesus went there frequently with his disciples. The traitor with steeled heart, had resisted the last graces of the cynical, he now went and settled the final plan for the betrayal of his master. During the night all could be managed without any tumult, so having got a body of armed men, and waited until nearly midnight so that all would be quiet, the fallen apostle and the chief priests set out for Gethsemane. With diabolical coolness Judas had warned the priest to be very cautious and careful when they took Jesus prisoner. Lead him cautiously, he said. He gave them a sign by which he would indicate Jesus to them. When they reached the entrance to the garden, our Lord came forth to meet them. By the uncertain light of the torches that they carried, it was difficult to recognize anyone. Judas hesitated a moment. Was he overawed by the divine majesty? Before the traitor recovered and gave the agreed sign, our Lord himself spoke to the crowd. He wished to give his apostle one more grace, and to remind him by a miracle of the divine power of the master he was betraying. Looking at the crowd that had come with Judas, our Savior asked him, Whom do you seek? And when they answered, Jesus of Nazareth, our Savior replied, I am he. At that word, by his divine power, he cast the whole band to the ground, so that both they and the apostle might realize how deliberately he was offering himself as their victim. Surely, this was a moment full of grace for the apostle, as he stood alone with the master and saw the evidence of his divine power. The hard heart of the traitor was unmoved, and while the band was rising from the ground, he stepped forward to give the chosen sign. He took his divine master in his arms and kissed him. And as he did this, he heard unmoved the gentle voice of Jesus saying, My friend, whereto art thou come? Judas, dost thou betray the Son of Man with a kiss? To kiss the face of Jesus, and yet to be unmoved. To kiss the face of Jesus was one of the special privileges of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Think of how she esteemed that precious maternal privilege. Think of the love, the joy, the unspeakable sweetness it brought to her immaculate heart. We read in the lives of the saints that some of them, like St. Stanislaus, St. Anthony, St. Felix, received a most special favor not granted to many. The Holy Child Jesus appeared to them and permitted their caresses thus showing how dear these saints were to him. Think now of what this favor was in the spiritual life of these saints, how it lifted their hearts to God and filled them with the most perfect love for their divine Master. 
Alas, a human heart that once knew the Savior intimately, the heart of one called to be an apostle, that heart had so hardened itself that even the privilege of kissing the face of Jesus failed to rekindle the extinguished fire of love. Can we conceive anything more awful, anything more terrifying for anyone who, conscious of having received special favors from God, is unfaithful to grace and resists the divine will and the special appeals of Jesus? Such infidelity, such resistance, is the root of dreadful crime. Let us now turn to the Lord Jesus and consider his sacred heart at this moment. What a wound! We often think of the insults offered to the sweet face of Jesus, the face of God, the face whose beauty is the rapture of heaven. We think of the blindfolding, the blows, the buffets, the vile spittle. But what cost Jesus most was the kiss of Judas. How the heart of Jesus shrank from this cruel sin. How much greater even than the scourging was the pain which the traitor's kiss had burnt on his blessed lips, and yet he spoke only words of gentleness to the traitor. Centuries before, the psalmist had spoken of this special suffering. If my enemy had reviled me, I would verily have borne with it. If he had hated me, had spoken arrogantly against me, I would perhaps have hidden myself from him. But thou, a man of like mind with me, my guide and my trusted friend, thou who didst take sweet meats with me, in the house of God we walked as friends. A few hours before, the Lord Jesus had instituted the most holy sacrament, and when at that moment his sacred heart was overflowing with love for all mankind, there was also in his sacred heart a great sorrow. He was instituting the most holy sacrament, foreseeing that it would be profaned. He foresaw the traitor's kiss, and hence the scripture tells us he was troubled in spirit. He repeated very often, One of you will betray me. And hence St. Paul, speaking of the institution of the most holy sacrament, reminds us that it was on the night he was betrayed. And yet, in spite of all this, our Lord in the garden addressed Judas as his friend. Friend, whereto art thou come? The friendship of Christ was still open to him, but he would not have it. He was deliberately going to his eternal ruin. This was the great sorrow of the heart of Jesus. A lost soul, and lost while the precious blood was being shed for the sins of the whole world. Subsequent events. Judas had now secured his ambition. He had received the thirty pieces of silver. For the moment, he was satisfied. The plan had worked well. He had got what he desired. He expected that Jesus would escape as formerly, and he would be still an apostle. But next day, when he saw Jesus a prisoner, apparently helpless, so terribly treated, condemned, about to be crucified, remorse struck him. Jesus, the good, the gentle, the kind, the considerate, done to death by treachery, and the traitor, one of his own familiar friends, himself. The thirty pieces of silver lost all their charm. The life of Jesus came before him as one clear vision of goodness, and his last words again resounded in his ears, Judas, dost thou betray the Son of Man with a kiss? It is thus with every sin. Before sin is committed, passion of one kind or another blinds us. After our sin, the charm is gone. Malice stands forth in all its stark reality, relentless, unadorned. This is a moment of vision, but unless hope illumines that vision, there's only unavailing remorse, and hope has its center in the one who alone is good. If the sinner looks to him and aspires to him for all healing, he will come to know the sweet peace of forgiveness, even as did St. Peter. St. Mary Magdalene, the good thief, and the multitudes of penitents since their time. The sorrow of Judas was without hope. He did not go to the Lord Jesus. He knew his goodness. Why did he not turn to him for mercy? 
why did he not ask Mary to intercede for him? If Judas had but turned his heart to Jesus for one instant, all would have been well. But his mind only had been enlightened. His heart was unchanged. It was like the sorrow of the damned. He had hardened his heart by his repeated acts of resistance to grace. It was rooted in selfishness. His sorrow was without aspiration to God, and therefore he knew only despair. Judas went to his partners in guilt, the scribes and the Pharisees. He cast down the money, and he cried, I've sinned in betraying innocent blood. The answer he got was, What is that to us? We can never get help from the partners of our sin. Judas cast down the thirty pieces and fled from the city. He fled to the valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem. From there his eye could sweep the road by which Jesus had been dragged the night before. Despair seized him, and he hanged himself. His mind torn by two pictures, Jesus, Judas, the life, the goodness of Jesus, his own ingratitude and sin. A heart may become so hard by resisting grace that nothing, not even the approach of death, can turn that heart to God again. What a terrible history! The fall of an apostle! It can only be compared to the fall of Lucifer from heaven. What a lesson of fear! If an apostle fell so low, who can be secure? We understand the fear of St. Paul, lest he might become a castaway, and his instruction that those who stand should take heed lest they fall, and that we must work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Are we going to be failures in the end? May Jesus in his mercy preserve us from thus grieving his sacred heart. May he enlighten us to see the danger before we're gone too far. Let us look at this terrible history of a failure. Then let us look into our own life and see if we can find there anything similar to the early life, to the first mistake of the apostle who began well but ended badly. In early life, during the first days of the public life, Judas received many precious graces. So have we. He loved Jesus once, and he got to know him well. He lived with him on terms of great familiarity. Is not this our own case? He began with self-seeking. This led to infidelities, compromise, hypocrisy, and then came deliberate and serious venial sins. Have we entered on that way? He did not know how hard his heart was becoming. Are we less sensitive to small sins than we used to be? Is our conscience less delicate? In other words, is our heart growing hard? These are very serious considerations. If we're on a downward path, where are we going to end? What security have we if we let things go further? Many have gone down this road and gone so far that, like Judas, their hearts became hard and nothing could soften them to real repentance. Let us be wise in time and listen to the warnings God sends. We are now easily moved to repentance, but it may not be so always. A human heart, by resisting grace, may get so hard that no ordinary grace can make any impression on it. A deathbed repentance looks easy to those who forget this hardness of heart, but to those who have hardened their own hearts death brings only natural fear and does not bring the heart to God. Some of us, perhaps, have tried in vain to get a person to forgive an enemy or to persuade a religious to be obedient. How hopeless reasoning was! No argument had any influence. To think of the state of a soul which we express by the words, A hard heart, is terrifying indeed. May God have mercy on us all. May he teach us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling lest after preaching to others we should ourselves become castaways. May he in his mercy keep us from being failures in the end. May he keep us from being a sorrow to his sacred heart, which has so cared for us, which has so favored us, which has so loved us. May he strengthen us to seek God, not self, in all things, to devote our lives to the establishment of his kingdom within our own souls, and in the souls of others, so that we may realize the loving design Jesus had in choosing us to follow him closely. 
The Nature of the Sin of Judas The whole world agrees that the crime of Judas is the foulest and blackest in the annals of human history. The very name of Judas has passed into a proverb, and the very mention of it brings up before our mind a picture of all that is most loathsome and detestable in human nature. Now it must be noticed that the sin of Judas is from its very nature a sin that can only in its full horror be consummated by Christ's intimates, by his friends. It is a sin that the mere servant in God's services cannot properly speaking commit. It is reserved in its full diabolical malice for the closest intimates and the once warmest lovers of Jesus Christ, for those who have had a kind of right to kiss him and call him friend. Neither is this sin of Judas so rare as is sometimes thought. In its full malice, no doubt it is rare, but in some degree its characteristic elements can be detected under certain outwardly less repulsive forms. Amongst these latter, we may rank that which consists in deliberately changing the ideal of love and loyalty to Christ, which was once openly professed. Such a betrayal is generally wrought in silence and is not evident to those who view merely externals. Like Judas, certain persons are to be met who once believed, who once had been ardent and wholehearted in the service of Christ. Just like Judas, they had been carefully chosen by our Lord to be instruments for making him known and loved by others. Since Christ thus selected them, they must have had at the beginning the qualities that would make them saints. Judas had such qualities. Like him, they too were given a training that should have made saints. Again, like him, they enjoyed the special affection of our Lord. They may have outwardly done good work for the cause of Christ. Judas too had worked for Christ. The children had blessed him when he came preaching the kingdom of God with power. The devils had been subject to him. But in spite of all that, a moment came when for some reason or another Judas found that Christ was not sufficient for him. He wanted something else. He sought to satisfy self rather than Christ, and then he proceeded to satisfy self at the cost of Christ. So, too, such souls find that the service and love of Christ do not satisfy them, and then, after rapid progress in self-seeking for the sake of a trifle, thirty shillings, the master is sold once more. The wretched trifle may be a moment's little empty self-love, a vain ambition, a false attachment to a mere creature. Fear the small beginning in the want of generosity. Ask our Heavenly Father to give us the plenitude of His grace, that we may be faithful to Jesus, loving Him above all, living in childlike surrender to the divine will. By this complete docility and fidelity in the details of religious life, we may keep near our Lord in the true sense of nearness, and come to know Him intimately with all that love and knowledge granted to the faithful disciple John when he rested on the bosom of Jesus. Knowing and loving Him thus, we shall, in our religious life, give testimony to Jesus and glorify our Father who is in heaven.